All righty. Awesome. So welcome to Positive Attention, Effective Communication, and Relationship Building Strategies for Planning Councils and Planning Bodies. Next slide, please. So, um, of course, as always on Planning Chat webinars, I want you guys to be super engaged, right? So attendees are in listen only mode, but if you do have a question, you can use the Q&A uh, box at the little left side of your screen um, to chat with me, the presenter, um, if you have any questions or concerns. I also have my colleague, Leanna Pham. She uh, is, is available to help you as well. If you think of any questions after the webinar, of course, you can always email us at planningchat at jsi.com. So I've already started speaking a little bit, but I want to make sure that you guys can hear me well. Just know that the audio is being shared via your computer speakers and your headset. If you can't hear the audio, make sure your computer audio is turned on. If you're still having problems, um, let me know or let Leanna know, and we'll be glad to help. Um, I just want folks to take a, um, a note of the call-in information. So we have the call-in number, the webinar ID, as well as the passcode. So I'm going to pause for a second there um, and have Leanna chat that information in so that you guys can have it if you want to write it down. Okay, perfect. So we're going to uh, get into our agenda for today. On the next slide, you'll see that we're going to have welcome and introduction. So we're going to talk a little bit about the benefits of effective communication for planning councils and planning bodies. We're going to talk a little bit about maintaining decorum in virtual and in-person meetings, as well as conflict resolution strategies, balancing your role as an advocate and community planner, and we'll wrap up with the question and answer portion at the end. Next slide, please. So we have our wonderful project officer on, uh, Mr. Lenny Green. So Lenny's going to give us a couple of words to kick off the webinar. Lenny? Thank you, and welcome for, and, and thank you for participating in today's webinar. Um, it's important to note that uh, passion and desire to provide good services are at the heart of what planning councils and planning bodies do and accomplish. Um, that passion can sometimes get in the way of meeting the legislative requirements, maintaining strong relationships, and, and challenge communicating effectively amongst the planning council and planning body members, planning council support staff, recipients, and other stakeholders. We can sometimes disagree about the best way to help our community. And today's webinar is an opportunity for you to examine skills and strengthen your relationships with your fellow planning council and planning body members, the planning council support staff, recipients and other stakeholders by experiencing some of the tools and innovative strategies that you'll see here today. Communication is at the heart of the best intentions and we're all working to provide the best possible care for our community members who really do rely on our planning and our actions. So we know that navigating group dynamics can be challenging, um, and it's especially when the stakes are so high. And we are working all, all of us, to ensure that the service system is meeting the needs of persons living with HIV. So one of the hallmarks of good communication is to know when tensions run high, it is important to remember that everyone is working together toward a common goal. And that goal is to end the HIV epidemic and ensure that there's care and support that's really important and efficient, and it's available to all the people who are living with HIV in our communities. We can only achieve that goal through mutual respect, strong relationships, and effective communication. So today's webinar will focus on a practice that helps support healthy communication and relationships in the vital work that we do, and, and, and especially for those communities that we serve that rely on what we do. I'm going to turn it back over to Jamal to continue with the presentation. And once again, thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Lenny. I really appreciate that. So let's get into it, guys. Um, I want to introduce you to some of to our fabulous presenters that we have today. Um, on the next slide, I'm going to introduce Ms. Quintana Slaughter. Hello. So, Hi. So Quintana, Quintana Slaughter is a Nashville 
Regional HIV Planning Community Liaison. She's also employed with the Metro Public Health Department as a Public Health Administrator One. As the community liaison, she is tasked with ensuring the planning council members and um, volunteers understand their roles pertaining to the Ryan White Party program. Ms. Lara's core personal and professional beliefs include leading by example, setting the tone for conduct and professionalism, and maintaining respect for others. So welcome, Quintana. Thank on the next you. slide, we have, thank you. So on the next slide, we have Carissa Wisedorf. So Kaliska is a lead planning council support staff for the Minnesota Council for HIV AIDS Care and Prevention, which serves as a community planning group for the Minneapolis St. Paul Part A TGA and the State Part B's HIV Prevention Program. Carissa has worked with the planning council in the Hennepin County Ryan White Program for seven years. So welcome, Carissa. So we also have Creed Gordon. So joining the fill of HIV 16 years ago, Shortly after their own positive diagnosis as a homeless youth and sex worker, Cree has dedicated their life to advocating for the needs of Black and Brown communities, young people, and queer and trans folks in sexual and reproductive health. Having done the work in Oregon, Louisiana, and on the national level, they've moved to Minnesota in 2017 to support HIV prevention efforts in the Twin Cities. Currently, Cree serves as co-chair for the Minnesota Council for HIV Care and Prevention. Lastly, but certainly not least, we have Larry McPherson. So Larry McPherson is the co-chair of the Minnesota Planning Council and is living and thriving with HIV. Larry enjoys educating people in his community and helping those less fortunate. So let's give a virtual hand clap for all of our uh, presenters today. On the next slide, you have me, your host. So my name is Jamal Refuge. And I am the virtual learning coordinator um, for Planning Chat, and I'm so excited to have you guys here today. Um, we have some great content that we're going to share with you. And I hope that you find today's webinar um, informative. So let's get into our objectives. So by the end of this webinar, you'll be able to utilize strategies for maintaining decorum in, in Planning Council planning body, virtual and in-person meetings, employ conflict resolution strategies to resolve different perspectives between members, Party, party recipients and other stakeholders. And lastly, you'll be able to understand the importance of balancing the member's role as an advocate and community planner. So I just wanna open up the webinar with a couple of quick statements. So this webinar aims not to explore where and how you meet, but to explore how you communicate and build relationships with one another to effectively, effectively serve your communities. So your commitment to working through communication and relationship challenges makes a difference for people at risk for HIV as well as folks who are living with HIV as well. So thank you for showing up and doing the work. We know it's not easy. Uh, we know we butt heads sometimes and things don't always go as planned, but you guys are definitely sticking it out and making things happen. So I appreciate you. So I want to talk a little bit about the, the benefits of effective communication for planning council and planning bodies. So on the next slide, there's a couple of things I want you guys to think about. So if we communicate effectively and we build strong relationships, we can have stronger and shorter planning council meetings. So we know planning council meetings can be very, very long. They can be two hours, three hours, sometimes four hours long because we have so much stuff to work on. But if we're not, if we're not communicating well, those meetings can become much, much longer. Um, and also one of the benefits of communicating effectively and having strong relationships is that we have fewer ad hoc meetings. So we have meetings, so we don't have to have those smaller meetings where we're pulling folks to the side and trying to figure out things. Um, there's also more cohesion and more harmony among members if you're communicating effectively. And there's also more respect as both a, an advocate and a community planner. Um, there's also better health, health outcomes for the people that are being served because we're moving more efficiently, we're getting things done. So those are just a couple of benefits. Of course, there are many, many more um, benefits, but uh, I just wanted to highlight those few as we move through the webinar. So I'm gonna to switch to talk about maintaining decorum in virtual and in-person meetings. And I wanna clarify what exactly is decorum. So decorum and quorum may sound similar, but they're not the same. Now, next slide, you'll see that I have some definitions there for you. So decorum is behavior 
that's controlled and calm and polite. Quorum refers to having set standards for the number of people, I'm sorry, the number of members needs to be present for a vote. So the quorum and quorum, they sound alike, but they're not the same. Um, on the next slide, you'll see that um, we're going to talk a little bit about virtual meetings, right? So we are all still in this virtual world. Virtual world. We're meeting virtually. We're connecting with each other in this way. And I want to ask our presenters, can you describe how switching from in-person to virtual meetings has impacted the way um, your members and your uh, party recipients and your stakeholders interact? And so I'm going to start with Carissa um, over in, in Minnesota to answer that question for me. Yeah, thanks, Jamal. Um, so we were able to move quickly to virtual meetings um, as soon as the pandemic hit Minnesota and we were um, facing a state shutdown, um, stay at home order. Um, we moved on to Microsoft Teams and at that time we polled all of our council and community members about their capacity to join by using technology and um, at that time provided one on one assistance for anybody who had to have a little bit more help um, getting onto meetings virtually. Um, we were also able to purchase tablets and data plans for members who needed them. So we were able to continue full um, participation from all of our members quite quickly. Um, the council had also recently elected Larry and Cree, our two council co-chairs. And um, I just found that they're super patient and very accommodating with members. So I think that really went a long way with making sure that we just continued without skipping a beat. And um, they really provide a place for people to learn and share. So we really appreciate that. Um, we find that in virtual meetings that the process goes quite quickly. So when we're doing trainings or kind of going over information, it's very easy to do in a virtual setting, but the engagement piece takes a lot longer. So um, to get people to participate um, is more difficult when we're all, you know, muted and behind a screen may or may not have video capabilities for the particular meeting. So we find that we have to allow more time for engagement, especially if you're using like a breakout room and also being clear about what we're asking of people when we're in breakout rooms or we're trying to get some participation. Um, but overall, I think our members really miss meeting in person. I mean, we hear it at every meeting and in evaluation. So we're really looking forward to that day again. Um, and our new members, especially our new consumer members, I feel like really missed out on having those in-person meetings um, and are maybe more disconnected from the work than people who had been participating for a couple of years before the pandemic hit. So, so you find that it's, it's an adjustment for everybody, right? Uh, especially those new members and existing members to kind of get comfortable with doing, um, you know, virtual meetings. Uh, is, that, is that what you're saying? Yeah, it's definitely different, um, but it's, it's also quite um, remarkable how quickly we were able to step into a completely new environment and something that a lot of members had been asking for is better remote technology because people did come from all over the state previously. All right, thanks. So I'm going to turn it over to Quintana. I want to ask you the same question. So can you describe how switching from in-person to virtual meetings has impacted the way members, party recipients, and other stakeholders interact with each other? Like uh, Minnesota, we were able to quickly um, do a turnaround from in-person to virtual. Um, at first, it was a little difficulty. Um, we had a little difficulty just navigating and getting people used to it. Um, but I allowed our council to make the decision themselves to strictly do um, virtual meetings. Um, I think the pros and cons for our council have simply been people just miss that interaction of being able to sit around tables and talk to one another and have that in-person connection that they were having before. Um, um, and being able to discuss things face to face. I think virtually, like Carissa stated, um, it's hard when everyone's muted and you uh, have a time limit based on Zoom or WebEx or Microsoft Teams. Um, but it's it's while it's been a challenge in some areas, it's, it's, it's still been great because we've been able to save the meetings, share them virtually, and reach out to other people who may not have been able to make our meetings in person. Now they can join in via the web. 
Right. So it sounds like, you you know, you may have had some challenges, but the virtual space kind of opened up, you know, the availability um, for people to join in and, and to meet with you guys. Yes, we have. Um, it, it's it's given people more of an opportunity if the timing before wasn't great for them because of meetings or because of appointments. And now, you know, we have a set time, um, just like we did before, but they can call in from their phones. They can log in and look at it, you know, sitting in an office. Okay. And so today's, you know, webinar is about decorum. And so I want to know from you, Quitana, on the next slide, so what strategies do you use to maintain decorum in your planning council and planning body uh, virtual meetings? Um, really, I try and make sure they stick to the issues. Um, I make sure that they use netiquette. Um, I make sure that people are listening to one another and taking their turns um, as they're supposed to. We utilize the chat box. We utilize private messaging. Um, the raise the hand method in order to make sure the meetings are still effective and and run as they're supposed to be run, just like you would in person. And um, we just make sure everyone is being polite, just as just as if they were sit sitting in the same room as each other. All right. So when we were putting together this webinar, you were talking about kind of having a general awareness of members' um, belief system, their attitude. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think it's. I think it's very important to know who your members are personally um, and where they stand on issues and how passionate they are. It'll give you a sense of whatever's on your agenda, um, how someone will react and um, how you can um, give them, I guess, a little leeway ahead of time about what is going to be discussed and, you know, kind of make sure that they understand we need to stay on task we need to stay on topic. Make your point, but let's do it in a respectful way. Right. So that's where we um, talked about the importance of being, you know, assertive versus aggressive. Right? Like you can say what's on your mind, you can say what you feel, but we still have to maintain that decorum. We still have to maintain that respect, you know, in the room. Yes. At all times, even and online. So you would, right. Even online. Right. Exactly. And so with those virtual platforms, can you maybe give one example of how you've used one of those tools? Um, I usually I can look at a person's um, facial expressions and see when they're ready to say something or uh, if they're if something is hitting, uh, I guess, a sour note with them. And private messenger is a lifesaver, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, not everyone can be privy to the conversation and you, the host, can talk to someone and see what their question is or what they want to get across just in case it's not open for them to say in front of everyone else. So I definitely utilize private messaging a lot um, when we have our meetings in order to answer questions um, just to keep the flow in the me meeting going in order and, and to stop any extra tension that may occur. Awesome. Thank you so much. So I'm going to switch to the folks in Minnesota. Um, so Larry is going to talk a little bit about some of their strategies on the next slide uh, for maintaining the quorum in virtual meetings. All right, Larry, I think you might be on mute. All right, sorry about that. There we that. go. All right. No problem. Okay. Uh, yes, we use a script to lead uh, meetings to ensure everyone stay on task. Uh, and our staff developed this tool to make sure we can stay on track with all meetings. And it also helps to make the meetings run much smoothly. Uh, number two bullet point, have a dedicated parliamentarian to serve as a mediator between members virtually and in person. Yes, we have a parliamentarian that sits uh, with us at each meeting. Uh, her name is Pat uh, Riemann, and she makes sure we follow the Robert Rules of Order to the T. And also she uh, sets up training uh, like uh, quarterly. Uh, to keep us updated and make sure everybody is on the same page. Uh, Pat is an outgoing person and she just, man, uh, helps us in any way that she can. And she's just very irreplaceable. Uh, number three, the uh, use of a buddy system to help new members orient, orient in, to the uh, planning council and planning body and signing boards for each other about disagreement. 
Well, yes, the buddy system to me is uh, just like mentoring. Uh, so what this is, this tool does is help the new members that joins the planning council to be able to better transition and more smoothly into in more smoothly and we st stay with them for more, for as long as they might need us also it may it makes up uh it's made up of council members that has been with the council for a few years or better and the co-chairs it's a very good system all right that's great i definitely like the sound of that buddy system it definitely sounds like it helps people um, you know, who are new, maybe to the planning council, kind of get acclimated, they can ask questions, if they're not unsure about something, they have someone they can turn to, to, uh, to get some support. Yes, yes, that's exactly true. And that's exactly what it was designed to do. Perfect. Thank you, Larry. So on the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit um, about some additional strategies that Minnesota uh, has. That includes action items and other parking lot and parking lots and other fun things. So, Creek, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, I got that piece. You got that piece. Well, take it away, Larry. Let him have it. <laughs> All right. Uh, this this made it, uh, an action item that includes background and information uh, rationale for issues that the council will vote on. Well, yes, the action item uh, first of all is formed by a motion uh, that is made from a committee and then sent to the executive committee for a vote. Then it's sent to the planning council where the background and rationale information come into play. And the acting co-chair will either announce it passes or fail after it has been voted on by the council. Uh, the next one is the use of a parking lot list for topics that may not have been addressed uh been addressed to be uh, ought to be addressed later well uh this piece uh we use the parking lot list as a place to go back and address issues that we didn't we didn't either have time for or could not finish discussing because of time restraints it's been very helpful in the past in the past. Oh, yes, awesome. And so it sounds like those um, action items are sent out in advance, right? So people can kind of prepare um, to act on them, you know, so to speak. Well, no, it's a motion. Uh, you have to make a motion in order to, uh, uh, the, the, in order for the action item to even be formed. Somebody, on. Uh, a member of the council have to make a motion on the floor. And then that's Got how, it. That's how it's it's becomes an action item. But to Thank answer you. Thank you for Oh, but Jamal, I was just gonna say to answer your question though, um, even though we do have a process for the action items to go through the committees, everyone does receive them um, a week before um, the council meetings. So that way all council members do know what action items um, we do have on the agenda um, and what we will be voting on too, so. Well, thanks for clarifying that. So we're gonna move on um, and talk a little bit about netiquette. So there are 10 rules to netiquette. And I want to explain what exactly is netiquette. So netiquette is a short form of network etiquette or internet etiquette. Um, so in, just to explain what etiquette means, so etiquette refers to behaving in a respectful manner towards other. And we practice etiquette every day when we say thank you, when we were on time for a meeting, when we say excuse me, we need to pass someone in the hallway. So we're practicing etiquette all day, every day. So it's nothing necessarily new, but we're having to practice etiquette in virtual spaces. So netiquette represents the importance of proper manners and behavior online. It's a set of professional and social etiquettes practiced and advocated for um, electronic communication over any computer network. So there are, as I mentioned earlier, 10 rules um, to network etiquette or, or netiquette, excuse me, I'm gonna break down each one of those. On the next slide, you'll see that rule number one is to remember the human. 
So your facial expressions, your gestures, your tone of voice, people pick up on those things, right? Sometimes there are folks who are in meetings, their face get there before they do. And it is important to be mindful of how you're showing up, you know, over your uh, over your camera screen um, when you're in these virtual settings. And you want to adhere to some of the same standards um, of behavior online that you follow in real life. Um, I always tell people that people are always watching you. No matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, folks are always watching you. And that's something you should always be mindful of. Um, you can also miss out on opportunities if you're not being ethical, if you are not, you know, maintaining respect in these virtual meetings, um, you may miss out on opportunities. Folks may be eyeing you for, you know, an executive director position or a leadership position, but you're not acting so nice in some of these virtual settings. So just what, how you behave in person, you should behave that way, on, you know, online. And know where you are in cyberspace. It's okay to lurk before you leap. So a lot of times for new folks, they want to, new folks at the planning council, they want to just jump in and just get going, get ready, but they may not necessarily understand what's the lay of the land, like how does the planning council operate? So it's perfectly okay to kind of sit back and observe, see how things go, and then move in to try to participate. Um, and that's true for virtual spaces as well as in-person spaces, right? And you want to respect other people's bandwidth and their time. You know, uh, some people don't eat, breathe, and live, you know, planning council. Some people have lives. You have moms and dads and brothers and sisters and boyfriends and girlfriends and cats and dogs and all that fun stuff. So people may not be as available as you would like them to. So you have to be respectful of folks' um, professional lives. So don't expect instant responses from things, um, from electronic communication that you may need. If you find that you need something from someone, you know, request feedback by a certain date or request that product or whatever you need from them by a certain time so that way that person can prioritize whatever it is that you need from them. And that's electronic communication, so that's email, that's in person, that's over, you know, a virtual uh, conference call, whatever. But just be respectful of other people's time. You know, make, make yourself look good online. That's not just like your facial features, all the other beautiful, but that that's that's how you show up in, in, in spaces. But you want to fact check before you share information. Um, you want to be pleasant and polite when using the chat box and other features. So the chat box is, is how we're pretty much communicating a lot and engaging with one another. So we want to be mindful of how we're using that so we don't want to use offensive language and, you know, things like that. And you want to share your knowledge um, folks have a lot of knowledge that they are sitting on that other people can benefit from. So if you have, you know, knowledge that, that can help the planning council move forward, share it. Don't hoard that knowledge. And don't be afraid to ask for a learning moment. All of us on this call have had to ask for a learning moment in some capacity. We don't know everything. Um, so we have to lean on other people to say, hey, like, you know, y'all were talking about X, Y, and Z to me that I had no idea what y'all were talking about. It sounded like cling on to me. Like, can you explain it to me? And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. And on the next slide, you'll see the, the following uh, three rules. Welcome discourse. So good vibes, bad vibes, negative vibes, neutral vibes, all vibes are welcome. Um, it's okay to express your disagreement with something or what somebody says, but don't, you know, call them names or threaten them with violence, tell them meet you outside in the parking lot, you know, you're taking your earrings off and they're meeting you ready to scrap. We don't need that, right? We're all adults and we all should be, you know, mindful and respectful and welcome disagreements. It's totally okay. And if people uh, know that planning councils are like family. So folks are going to share personal stories. They're going to share stuff about the HIV status. They may share traumatic events that they've gone through. And it's like Vegas. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. So it's important to respect other people's confidentiality and respect their personal stories. And don't abuse your power as an administrator or a host. So if you're the person in control of the Zoom meeting, like don't meet somebody because you like what he had to say. So that goes against rule number seven, welcoming discourse, welcoming disagreement. Um, but you know that you um, should be open and welcome to other opinions. And be forgiving of other people's mistakes. That's the final rule. Offer grace. Um, folks may say your pronouns wrong. Like that happens from time to time. And just, you know, go ahead and just politely correct me and say, hey, my programs are he, him, and his, or they, them, and there. And that person will, you know, take that in, and they'll correct it next time. And know about intent versus impact. So what you heard may not be what they said, and vice versa. So intent does not matter. 
It's impact. It's how you made someone feel. So intent versus impact. Always remember that when you're interacting with folks. And if you do make a mistake, if you do hurt someone, make amends. So that's a, a virtual handshake. That's an apology. That's a, hey, can we talk about it offline? You know, whatever it is you need to do in order to make sure that your communication is effective and that your relationships are strong. Next slide, please. So I want to shift to talk a little bit about in-person meetings. So I know some folks are meeting in person now, and I want to know, um, starting with the folks in um, Minnesota, what strategies do you use to maintain the core of an in-person meeting? Well, I'm a big fan. This is Cree. I'm a big fan of an icebreaker. I love icebreakers. Um, it's also a really easy way to um, get to know people if you are creative with the icebreakers. So, you know, before the webinar, we all were joking about how cold it gets in Minnesota. So like, you know, I, I may ask like people's favorite winter activity or um, we have a very um, racial and ethnically diverse uh, planning council, even though um, Minnesota is very white. So sometimes I can ask about like, family traditions or holiday traditions. So that way we are getting to know each other um, better that way as well. But I also think you can use an icebreaker to do like a temperature check, right? And so over the last year, like we've done icebreakers where we've asked people um, just how they're feeling during COVID and during the pandemic. Um, and, you know, we live uh, in Minneapolis and so we had uh, icebreakers where we asked people how they were feeling around, you know, George Floyd's murder. So you can actually use it one to get to know people um, that you get that you're having to work with around, you know, a lot of intense issues. But then you can also um, use it as a temperature reader of the room. Awesome. And so can you tell us a little bit? Um, and just, you know, anyone, tell us a little bit about uh, how you design your meeting space so that um, everyone is in, feels involved. I believe Larry was going to tell us a little bit about that, right? All right, Larry, you're on mute. I'm sorry, that, that mute button got me. All right. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. All right. Yes, we have uh, our meeting uh, table set up like a U-shape and uh, the two co-chairs, the parliamentarian staff sits uh, at the U-shape and the council members, uh, the council members are on both sides so that we can see everyone clearly, but it also gives us uh, full control of the room so that we can easily recognize individuals who might have their hands up or maybe have learning moments or et cetera. And I'll jump in to talk about the other item about that. So I think having the U shape also really focuses the attention on the council members. So when we have council and committee meetings, we really want the discussion and the work being moved forward by council members and not staff or guests who may be attending. So um, in addition to how Larry described the table set up, we have kind of like a gallery area where we have other guests who attend meetings, um, recipient staff and other providers or community members. Um, so the council co-chairs can make sure that they're calling first on council members. Um, that's also written on the agenda that Council members will have the opportunity to speak first, and then if there's time and the co-chair calls on them, then um, people who are sitting in the gallery or as guests will be able to participate. Um, we also kind of incorporate this into our training that we do with our executive committee members, which is made up of our co-chairs. Um, and then I think, uh, tactic that we used, we did it in person, um, was to have a three per, or three question post meeting survey available to all of the participants during the meeting. Um, you can see the three questions that we had printed out each time and um, 
the purpose of implementing this was that we were finding that people, um, they would have kind of a bad meeting or they didn't really like how they were treated or saw other people being treated and they would just leave the council and they wouldn't come back and they wouldn't really tell anybody, you know, why they left. Um, so once we had the survey available, we were kind of able to just quickly kind of have a conversation and talk to people and find out like how they experienced the meeting that day. Um, and we got really good feedback on that. So, you know, if there was a particularly tough meeting, more people filled out the survey and asked to be contacted afterwards. And so I could have a one on one conversation to get their side and then also maybe provide a different perspective of kind of what I know about the person who maybe they had an issue with. Um, and then also bring those results to our council co chairs at our, we have a monthly check in before all of our executive and council meetings. Um, so go through those surveys and talk about how are we going to improve things um, to make sure that the meetings are working for everybody. All right, so it sounds like you use that data from those surveys in order to improve your processes, right? Yep. Awesome. So on the next slide, I'm going to transition over to Quintana in Nashville to give us some of her strategies for in-person meetings. For our meetings, um, we really try and follow the Robert Rules of Order guidelines. It makes it kind of simple to look at uh, the examples and kind of lead our meetings that way. Um, everyone is given a copy um, as new members, this in their new member orientation binders, and it allows them to take a look at it at the beginning to kind of understand and get acclimated to it. Um, also, if there comes a time in our meetings where things are a little heated and there's tension, I give people the opportunity to take space and walk away, go outside. I, I will possibly go with them if I notice that they need a little extra help in talking through whatever the issue is. Um, uh, we don't really um, have meetings where it gets super explosive, but I, you know, I ask everyone just act like an adult. We, we're all here for one reason and let's respect one another. And we can come back to the table separately and talk about the issues, just not during the meeting because we need to get through our agendas. Um, also, we use cue cards to maintain our time. Um, don't want people to go over a certain limit because we want to make sure we make space for all of our issues and get through our agenda. If someone looks as though they're going over time, I hold up, you have five minutes or you have 10 minutes. And I usually use those so I don't interrupt the flow of the conversation. We want to be able to make sure that everyone gets out what they need to get out in the time frame that they have. So can you tell us about how you um, orient folks um, to the Robert Rules of Orders? I believe that you um, include that as part of like an onboarding process, right? Yes, it's included in binders that uh, we created in order to share information. So it's a couple sheets of paper that uh, we took from the Robert Rules of Order, just the basic skeleton of it, um, and just explaining, well, this is what our agendas will look like. This is how the meetings are conducted. We describe quorum, and it gives them just an overview of something that they may not be aware of and just kind of how the meetings will flow and etiquette and everything else. All right, and just, and just to make sure that um, everyone does understand what rival rules of order is, can you just give like a one sentence, you know, description of that really quickly? Uh, Robert's Rules of Orders, there's a book called, are you asking the description for the book or? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's a book called Robert's Rule of Orders for Dummies. Um, it's pretty much my Bible on how to <laughs> conduct meetings mm -hmm. and have etiquette. And it, it, bake, it breaks down how, for me, how, how to get things started. And a lot of people I don't think are even aware that it exists because um, I wasn't at first, um, but it's definitely been a lifesaver in how to get things started um, in a more efficient way, I think. Lovely summary, thank you. So on the next slide, I wanna ask uh, Carissa and then Cree, what advice would you give to planning council struggling to maintain the quorum in their meetings? Um, so I think, you know, the, the strategies that we're sharing today are 
processes that we've put in place that we find make meetings more efficient and make sure that they work for the people in them. But um, there's also a, a term that I've recently learned called KORD, and it's kind of like a combination of the word chaos and organization. And I think it's really important in our meetings that we sort of balance this. So if you um, have no processes in place, then you're going to have chaos. You're going to have meetings that are unproductive and people won't feel like we're getting anything done. We're not gonna get through the agenda. But also if you're too organized and kind of rigid with the rules that you have in place, then you don't really open it up for that organic conversation and um, interaction that people just have naturally. So I think it's really important. And I think our council has gotten to a place that we do balance the sort of chaos and the organization um, well. Um, just like what I talked about with a three question survey, we we constantly ask for feedback from our council members. We just recently participated in the Health HIV Planning Council Planning Body Assessment, um, and we have regular evaluations. And so we, we ask people how things are working for them. Um, we report back to what we've learned from the results, and then we are very intentional about incorporating it and making changes with our leadership and our staff and our committees and our council to make sure that we're adjusting to the current needs of the council because you know things that may have worked 10 years ago or 20 years ago doesn't necessarily work today. Um, we also really refer to the roles and responsibilities of our council and committees often. So we look at the legislation, we look at our bylaws to make sure that what people are asking for is something that's within our purview. And then if it's kind of out of scope for the council, we'll close the loop with that about, you know, whose responsibility is that? Is that a government recipient? Is that the sub recipient's responsibility? And then um, report back to them about kind of how we left that off or what the next steps are with that. And then also having policies that the council creates and adhering to them and ensuring that we're applying them equitably to all council members and staff and um, you know we don't want to play favorites with anybody but that we can always refer back to a policy and um, and procedure. And then um, so a few things that I'll add is um, having a dedicated consumer committee to solicit um, to solicit input um, from the community has been um, really helpful, not only for um, like the consumers that are on our actual planning council, but for consumers who don't have as much time or can't dedicate as much time to the council, it's easier for them to make one meeting for a couple hours um, to be able to give feedback on the things that um, we're working on and how and help us direct our work. Also, I'll reiterate having a neutral parliamentarian. Um, it's also really helpful. Um, Quintana's uh, Robert's Rules for Order for Dummies is amazing, but um, it's also really nice to have um, someone who just knows it like the back of their hand. Um, and um, Pat isn't you know, she's paid to do that. Like, so she's neutral. Um, she's paid to be there. I um, mean, also just try new things and have fun, you know, bring your council into the 21st century. <laughs> um, you know, utilize things like social media to uh, chat with young people or um, mix in some of this uh, virtual um, things that we've learned in the last year into the meeting, the in-person meetings too. So then that way you can um, incorporate uh, more people and more voices um, into the process. So um, yeah, and take time to get to know each other. That always makes working together um, so much easier. So even if it's just showing up a couple minutes early and having coffee and a donut um, <laughs> with someone that you haven't chatted with before, it's also super beneficial. Awesome, right? So being intentional, right? Being intentional about yeah. getting to know the people that, that, that you're working with, right? Um, because, mm -hmm. you know, planning council members definitely do form relationships for life, you know, some of them. And so it's good to know who's in the room. Yes, absolutely. Larry's stuck with me for life now. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm pretty sure he would rather be stuck with anyone else but you. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to transition and I'm going to ask Quintana, what advice would you give to planning councils struggling to maintain decorum in their meetings? Um, to try and discuss matters privately. Um, I think not all matters are needed to discuss in such an open forum, especially with guests, um, public members. It's kind of like airing your dirty laundry. Um, so I think to see if people are having some, some difficulties, try and talk to each party separately first and then bring them together to see if you can um, bring them to an understanding of why the other person is feeling the way that they're feeling about something. Um, try and express to them what you see from each one of them and what passion they bring. And then at the end of it all, try and get them to see and understand what we're here for. What is the reason? And, and that is why we're here. And to kind of let the disagreement go away. You know, um, it's, 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 it's no reason to have um, such tension when we have one goal at hand. Perfect. So on the next slide, I want to transition and talk a little bit about conflict resolution strategies. Um, and I'm going to give a couple of that you guys may find helpful. So one of the first um, conflict resolution strategies on the next slide that you'll see is ground rules of community promises. I like community promises better. Ground rules just sound so, you know. But you want to reintroduce those community promises at every meeting. A lot of times when planning councils first get started, they come up with a list of ground rules or community promises, and they never bring them up again. So but if you bring them up at every meeting, you set the tone for how the meeting is going to go. And as I mentioned earlier, intent versus impact. You know, make amends, you know, when you hurt somebody regardless of intent. And the last but not least strategy that I want to provide, which is one of my favorites, is mindfulness. So mindfulness is the quality or state of being conscious or aware of something. So consider doing an internal weather report with yourself on how you're feeling before you go into a meeting. So if you know that you're upset about something, you know, somebody in the break room ate your sandwich during lunch and you still mad about it, take a minute and like breathe and be aware of the fact that you're upset and do what you need to do to, in order to rectify that within yourself. Because the last thing you want to do is bring that energy into the room and just make everything worse for everybody. So do your internal weather report. You can do it when you wake up in the morning. You can do it before a meeting. You can do it before you go to bed. Like, how am I feeling? And what can I do to make myself feel better so that I'm not negatively, negatively impacting other people? So on the next slide, um, uh, Quintana and then uh, the folks in Minnesota are going to share what their conflict resolution strategies are. So I'm going to start with you, Quintana. So for me, um, if there are some issues between members, I've had private discussions with them separately. Um, like I said previously, um, I think it's very important to get to the root of the issue and allow people to hear each other. Um, what I've learned even in just personal dealings and dealings outside of the council and with the council is that a lot of times people are listening to respond. They're not listening to understand someone else. So if I have them separately um, and me being kind of a mediator, I can allow one person to speak and I the other person just hold on a second let's hear them all the way through because you may pick up on something that you didn't even hear the first time around and it gives people room to fully understand what someone's meaning is and it allows for the air to be clear on both parties and I you know I encourage people to take notes um, I encourage people to share the impressions that they have of one another because usually problems are just so small and we make them so large and, and they can easily be cleared away most times if you just listen to one another. And I, I love what you say about sharing impressions. That, that was one of the favorite things that you said um, when we were putting this webinar together because you'll be surprised how much you have in common with a person, you know, versus how much you don't. And I loved how you talked about um, how you were able to sit two people down and kind of, they kind of talk through and next thing you know, like two weeks later, like their buddy, buddy, they're sitting together, you know, at the meetings and they're getting along great because you were able to bring them together. They were able to just talk it out. You know, I think that's great. Right. They found a common interest, like you said, and a lot, even with virtual, this is why I'm so glad we're going back to in-person meetings. It's going to give people an opportunity to get to know one another again and talk about things that pertain to what we're there for, but also the personal issues and the personal things that we're missing out on. So. 
All right. And you have, you've been putting together these strategies, or you've been using these strategies, I should say, uh, for a little while now. So can you describe a time in which uh, an attempt to resolve a conflict among members and it didn't turn out quite the way that you thought it would? And what did you learn from that experience? Um, well, I had an exchange when I first came on um, with members who had disagreements before I came on. I attempted to resolve it and have them sit down and discuss with one another. But being that I was new, I didn't know the full scope of what the issue was. Unfortunately, one of them decided to leave the council. One of them stayed. And, you know, I was... I didn't want the person to leave. I wanted to get to know the person. I felt that the person was very valuable to the council, um, but it, it taught me that I needed to personally get to know everybody, personally understand where they're coming from. So, and you know, even though I was new, I still probably should have took more time to get to know that person, and maybe I could have stopped that person from leaving. You know. Right, right. So, so let's flip it. So let's talk about the positive. So can you describe one time you've used one of these strategies or a different strategy and it worked out well for, worked out well for you? Well, like you mentioned, um, I had some members who had a disagreement and um, I just brought them together and we listened to each other. We talked, they shared what they thought about the issue. They shared where their passions lied. And like I said, next thing you know, they're sitting at meetings, they're hanging out together outside of the, the planning council and they, they've become very good friends. Um, and I'm not gonna pat myself on the back for it because they did the work, but I'm glad that I was able to get them in a room together to talk, to, to, to have a discussion that they may not have had at, um, without me saying, hey, you guys, we're going to meet, we're going to talk so that we can't have these, this problem that's ongoing, so. Awesome, thank you. So I'm going to transition over to the folks in Minnesota. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the strategies you guys are using um, mm -hmm. to resolve conflict? Absolutely, and it's actually like a really good uh, transition because one of the things I was going to talk about is prioritizing um, trainings to manage future disagreements. And the one I think about the most is our um, intercultural communication training um, that we did with the planning council because we felt like we weren't communicating well um, because we had different types of people in the room um, with different types of communication styles. And then, so once we once we went through that training, um, like people understood that like I cree when I'm starting to get loud or emotive, it isn't that I'm angry, but it's probably that I'm feeling like I'm not being understood or not feeling like I'm being heard, right? And conversely for me, I learned um, that even though I asked a simple question to a Minnesotan, I'm gonna get a story because they're indirect communicators and they have to go around the block to get across the street is what I like to describe it. So I know my answer is not going to be super simple, even though it's just, but that's just literally, I've learned that that's just how they communicate, right? Like that's how they're taught. That's how it is in the community, right? And so um, in having that training, I think it's been, um, or trainings like that, because we've had additional trainings, like, you know, after that, it allowed us to better understand and communicate with each other because we learn the communication styles in the room. Um, so that was super helpful. Awesome. So uh, Chris, I do believe you have um, some additional thoughts, right? Um, yeah, well, I just wanna shout out to Cree because I think I learned something about the way Minnesotans communicate. <laughs> that I identify with and never knew that there was a term for it. <laughs> um, so we have a council um, code of conduct that our new members receive a policy and sign. Um, we also review it and sign it annually with all of our members and then people who participate in, in our meetings. Um, and it's just a way that we have written down the guidance for appropriate behavior when we're conducting council business and then a procedure for addressing violations to the code of conduct. Um, it's applied equally to all participants and anybody can bring up um, an issue of a code of conduct violation and then it goes through a process of um, first to our council co-chairs who can just determine whether or not um, it should be investigated by our executive executive committee. Um, so I think it's helpful to have something that we can all refer to and agree on. Um, and then as we review it, you know, if people feel like changes need to be made um, as part of our bylaws and it can go through that process. Um, 
And then if something seems more to be like an interpersonal dispute between any members, um, we have a conflict resolution policy. And um, so we can refer people to that. It's available on our council website. And um, I think that can kind of head off any you know, further issues of interpersonal problems that seep into meetings or could you know, eventually evolve into a code of conduct violation. Right, and I do believe that sometimes your reference, right, back to the code of conduct, sometimes in meetings when things aren't going the way you know, that they should, is that correct? Yeah, I think anybody can bring it up at any point if they feel like, you know, somebody's not abiding to the code of conduct. And it it can be issues large and small. So it's, you know, small things about like paying attention in meetings, you know, not being distracted by being on your phone, two large things, you know, about um, respecting others and, you know, valuing the diversity of opinions and people. Um, so it kind of encompasses everything. Okay. And so Carissa, can you describe a time in which you attempted to resolve a conflict um, and it was unsuccessful? And what did you learn from that experience? Yeah, so I think similar to Quintana, um, just kind of learning that, like, you're not able to change everybody, um, that there's just going to be some people that don't get along. Um, so we've had disputes between, you know, members and then leaders, and usually, like, our leaders are more responsible for working together. So if there is conflict and discord among two leaders, it can really affect the work of the council and the committees. Um, so I think I just got to the point where I realized that, you know, people might just never get along and, um, you know, trying to force them to work together is not going to work for anybody. So just dividing up the responsibilities, um, using each individual's strengths to kind of give them certain tasks to work on, and then that helped to move the work forward. And I think it solved some problems. Awesome. So just, you know, on the flip side, can you describe a time in which you used, you know, one of these strategies or a different one and it turned out well? Mm -hmm. um, so I think what has gone well is, um, you know, my realization that trust is not just automatic and guaranteed. That is something that you have to work on. And so um, I try hard to establish trust with their members. I think one thing that goes a long way is to get to know people individually, like Quintana has mentioned as well. Um, and, you know, it's harder for someone to be mean if, if they know you. And um, so I think that was some advice that like I got early on. Um, and when there has been a breakdown of trust to confront it straight on. So pick up the phone, call the person, you know, schedule a coffee meeting or a time to chat and really kind of listen to what is the root of the issue. Um, have the tough conversation and then certainly apologize if you did something wrong or if your, you know, impact was different from your intent, recognizing that and, and not making excuses for your behavior. And then ultimately making changes and sticking to it. So, um, you know, being willing to put in the work to improve yourself. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So uh, we're going to transition and talk about our last topic, which is balancing your role as an advocate and a community planner. So on the next slide, you'll see that members often join as advocates. You know, they bring their passion, they have fires in their bellies, they're ready to get going. You know, they have their goals and their dreams and things that they want to accomplish with and on behalf of the planning council. Um, but it's important to provide a voice. Um, members do provide a voice for their communities and other populations, um, as well as they learn to advocate for those populations as a part of being um, a planning council member. Um, but it's important that members learn how to be planners as well. Um, we have to consider the entire community, all people living with HIV. The planning council is, des is designed to serve all communities. So black folks, white folks, Asian folks, um, gay folks, trans folks, gender non-conforming, all, everyone, the planning council is for everybody. Say it with me, say it with your chest. The planning council is for everybody, okay? And you wanna seek to have more win wins versus win loses. So it basically means that we are accomplishing our goals, 
that we're not leaving anybody behind, that no issue is going unaddressed. Um, you want to be able to listen and, ask, and allow people to ask questions. You want to come, come prepared. You want to look at data and reports. We know that the Planning Council makes decisions based on data and not in passion, please, right? We all have things that we are passionate about, but um, the Planning Council's objective is to make decisions based on data. That dictates how, you know, um, <laughs> I'm looking at the chat, so it dictates how uh, money is being spent, how decisions are being made. So we have to look at that data. Um, and you also want to, you know, make and understand what people's boundaries are and try not to violate those boundaries, right? We know that these needs can get very passionate. We know that people really care about communities that they are a part of. But again, we have to, you know, set, set some boundaries. All right, next slide. So it's important to balance not only your roles, but your power too. Uh, we know that sometimes the planning council meetings, they are very dominant people. Um, they can sometimes create an uncomfortable, you know, environment. So it's important to use strategies that provide balance and opportunity for everybody to engage. Um, you want to address apathy, which means lack of emotion and, and passivity. Sometimes you have planning council members who are just like, you know what, we can do that. I'll just go along to get along and we can just, okay, whatever, you know, so-and-so says, we'll just do that. And they don't, they're not really engaged. They're not really involved. They're not really speaking up. And, and they may have, you know, really great ideas, but they don't feel comfortable, you know, speaking up because one person is just is just bulldozing through the meeting. So you want to, you know, search those, uh, uh, look out for those people in the room who are not as vocal, um, you know, with their with their concerns. You know, um, but you want to find resources on power and balances and, um, for a nonprofit organization. So it's important that those resources are educational, that they're solution focused. And they include strategies for different types of power imbalances, right? So that educational power imbalances, the provider patient, there's consumer imbalances. So just being aware of the different types of imbalances that exist and strategies to help combat those things. And at the end of the day, we want to honor all the voices of all the members and their experiences as well. Next slide, please. So uh, Quintana Nashville is going to talk about how um, she balances her role as both an advocate and a community planner. Um, for me, I try and make sure I understand who we're serving, who our community is there working for. Um, we serve 13 counties here in Nashville, so I know that it's not just, uh, like you said, um, one ethnic group of people or one gender, it's everybody. Um, so when I do recruitment, I'm looking at what our HRSA requirements are, but I'm also looking at what we're lacking on the planning council and what we need, what voices we need to hear more of and who needs to be at the table and who hasn't been at the table. Um, so it's everybody. It really is everybody, like someone said in the chat. Um, so I just try and make sure that we are focused on the areas whose voices haven't been heard. Um, um, as we had talked previously before, and even in our area, our trans community is, we haven't had their voices as loud as other voices. Um, our um, population of um, African-American women, we haven't had their voices as loud. And so I don't try and focus on them just like the whole time. I try and give them like maybe two weeks where I just completely go to that area and I'm talking to those people and trying to get them to come to our meetings and be a part of the committees. Um, it's not always easy, but um, I stay I stay with my feet to the ground and making sure that I explain who we are, what we do, and why they're needed. And um, I just try and make them welcome when they do show up. I love that. You know, finding people who are missing, finding those voices that are missing. I think that's important because it helps to ensure that we're reaching everybody. The planning council is for everybody. And I'm gonna keep on saying it. It's for everybody. So I'm going to transition um, to the folks in uh, Minnesota to tell us a little bit about how they balance their roles in their um, as both an advocate and community planner. Yeah, and so one of the um, big things um, that we do in um, on our planning council, is, especially because we serve everybody, is that we create um, space for community specific issues. And so one example of that is um, in our disparities and elimination um, committee, we created an ad hoc group um, to tackle issues of gender, specifically not having um, transgender 
data um, in our HIV numbers. So we as a planning body, when we received new state numbers, we asked where the trans numbers were and we didn't like the answer. And so um, we decided to create a group to um, make sure that those folks um, who identified as trans and non-binary felt like they were appropriately represented in data and in numbers. Um, and they are now um, based on the work that um, that group did. But we then as a planning body also um, wanted to be better. So even though like HRSA gives us specific um, like uh, requirements for who is on um, our planning body and you know who's a consumer, we decided as a Minnesota body that we were going to create a space on the council specifically for a trans or non-binary um, consumer. And so we didn't, we didn't just like uh, make sure that they're represented in the numbers, but we wanted to make sure like they were represented on our planning council as well. And um, so that they didn't have to bring a folding chair, we just pulled up a chair for them too. So um, making sure that you are taking on the issues um, that are affecting uh, the people that you're trying to serve. And Carissa, do you want to talk about our interviews? Yeah, um, I also want to have a shout out to, there's a great resource. I think it was developed by EGM Consulting about this um, specific topic, balancing your role as an advocate and a community planner. So um, I urge people to check that out. We use that in our new member orientation, and it gives like specific examples of when you're coming to the table as an advocate, and then how do you use your role as advocate, and then how do you use your role as planner? So I think it's a great way to kind of make that distinction and see how things go hand in hand. Um, when we have a, a person apply to the council and they fit one of our vacancies, um, they're always interviewed by our council staff and um, members of our membership and training committee. And I think it's a really good way to get to know prospective members better. Um, we can find out what are their interests, what experiences do they have, and you know how will they fit into the council and what committee might they work best in um, so we can really help leverage their skills as both an advocate and a planner in the different activities that the council has. Um, and I've also found that through these interviews and um, even if I don't sit on every single one of them, um, we discussed our interview after um, with our membership and training committee after the interview, um, we can kind of decide what future training needs might we need to have kind of based on some of their responses. Um, so we can give additional resources in the new member orientation or plan for additional trainings that people may need to have. So we make sure that the space is working for everybody. Awesome, thank you so much. So I'm gonna transition and talk about some resources that you guys can use um, going forward as we are working on balancing our roles, as, as we're working on conflict resolution strategies and all that fun stuff. So on the next slide, you'll see that we have um, a resource called Effective Planning Council uh, Planning Body Meetings. So this lays out some additional strategies um, for having effective meetings, right? And so you can find that in our training guide on the Planning Chat website. It's free and easy to download. Um, on the next slide, we already talked about this resource a little bit already, Robert's Rules of Order, right? So we have a more simplified version of it. Um, there's also a link where you can find the, the actual book itself. Um, so please take advantage of that resource that again can be found in our compendium of materials on our website. Um, so please take advantage of that resource. And I believe you may have, oh, no, that's the end of the resources. So now we're gonna transition to the question and answer period. I know that we already have a couple of questions um, kind of brewing in the chat right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and share some of those questions out. So the first question uh, that we have is from Chuck. Um, could you clarify the um, charge of disparities and elimination committee? Yeah, I can do that. This is Cree from Minneapolis. So our disparities and elimination um, committee we uh, are the committee of the planning council who focuses on um, the needs of the 
folks who live furthest on the margins, right? So when it comes to issues of like race or gender identity, or even things like age and aging with HIV, um, we kind of discuss like ways that um, we could better support the like community efforts and the planning council efforts to um, reach these folks and make sure that one, that they know about resources, but two, that they're um, utilizing um, those resources to help us um, address some of the um, disparities as it relates um, to our city. So basically we just kind of take on um, those issues like addressing um, the issues of the folks who are just on the margins, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think in addition to that, um, the committee, so it's a standalone committee. Um, it meets, mm -hmm. you know, just like all of our other committees. Um, they have specific roles and responsibilities, like anything related to our MAI funding. Um, mm -hmm. Disparities Elimination Committee will um, first review and then um, different activities of the planning council. So our needs assessment survey that we recently did um, when the committee was looking at um, how we were going to ask questions related to race and ethnicity, gender identity. Um, we brought that to Disparities Elimination Committee to review and then ultimately decide how those questions were going to be asked. And I think um, a great strength of the committee is um, that, you know, they're very, much experts in health equity and health literacy. So they serve as like kind of improving all of our health literacy and equity literacy um, with our, not only the council members, but government recipient staff as well. Thank you. Uh, so we have a question from David. This one is for you, Carissa. Can you please restate the resource used um, a reference that was referencing about uh, balancing your role as an advocate and community planner. Can uh, he wasn't quite clear what the name of that resource was, if, if, if you know. Um, if you give me a moment, I will find it in the documents. And I'm wondering if it's already on the planning chat website. I would suspect that it is, um, but I can. Yeah, find we can the... definitely find it. Yeah, we can find it and share that out. So just be on the lookout for that, David. Um, in our follow-up uh, email communications. We'll share some uh, resources as well as the ones that were shared in the presentation earlier. Don't worry about it, Carissa, I got you. Don't worry about it. Um, so we also have some questions that were answered earlier that folks may not have not had an opportunity to hear. Um, just please know that the, a recording of the training will be available. So just give us a couple of days to get it up. Um, uh, Creed, there was a question for you about accessing the intercultural communication training. So can you tell folks a little bit about that? Yes, I'll actually pass it on to Carissa because Carissa knows the resource better than I do. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to um, send the person's name. Um, she's regarded as an expert within our community. She trains, um, you know, bodies similar to ours up to large corporations. Um, so I think if people want to send me their email address, if they want it directly, then um, I can do that. So I know I got at least one if other people, some people are coming up as anonymous, so I'm not able to see who they are. Yeah, so if you would like a specific resource from Carissa, please chat in your email and I'll be, uh, I'll make sure that she gets it. And I'll put my email into the chat as well. Alrighty. Um, I, I think we have one more question coming in right now. Chris, you're getting a lot of email. <laughs> awesome. So um, that's it, folks. Thank you guys so much for participating in the webinar today. I definitely hope that you found this helpful. I hope you found it interesting. I hope you found it informative. I definitely wanted to take a moment and thank Cree and Quintana and Larry and Carissa for doing such an amazing job today. They really helped to bring this content home. 
So please keep an email out, uh, keep an eye out for your email. We'll be sharing some resources. Please do not forget to complete the evaluation. It helps us to know what's working well, what's not working well, and what you guys would like to see more of in the future. So thank you, and please have a great day and stay safe. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Jamal. No problem, of course. Thank you, Thanks Jamal. for having me, Jamal. Thank you. Thank you. Great job, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lenny. Thanks for allowing thank us to do this. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Lenny. All right, have a good one. It was nice meeting you, Quintana. Nice to meet you as well. I'll be in touch with y'all. I have your email, so I'm going to send an email out to all three of you. All right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, let's stay in touch. <laughs> yes, definitely, Chris and Kree and Larry. Y'all have a great rest of your day. You too. Thumbs up. Bye-bye.